Shall we gather at the river Where bright angel feet have trod With its crystal tide forever Flowing by the throne of God Yes, we'll gather at the river The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints at the river That flows by the throne of God Soon we'll reach the silver river Soon our pilgrimage will cease Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. On the margin of the river, washing up its silver spray, we will talk and worship ever, and have a happy golden day. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. That flows by the throne of God. Oh, welcome to First Reformed Church. It's wonderful to be back preaching. Uh, thank you to uh, Jerry Van Someren for filling in for me last week. I was supposed to go do some military training. That did not happen. So I'm back here with you all uh, wonderfully. Uh, spent some uh, time this week out and about. Went to Wausau. That was fun. I was not needed there, but was still told to be there. So that's where I was. And uh, then got to spend some time in Hammond uh, on Friday. So... It's been a fulfilling week, um, doing army things and seeing some of y'all. Uh, hopefully you, you all had fun during windmill days. Uh, got to enjoy a lot of good food, which is nice to have some variety in the area. So uh, hopefully it's been a relaxing time. I know it was for me and Heather, and, and Leaf had some fun too. Uh, just a reminder, consistory is next Tuesday, and uh, I want to thank... Greg Zwald and Cal Hopp for their service, both to the church and the consistory, um, as they depart, and uh, Mr. Dennis Oman fills their place as our new deacon, so thank you both very much for your time. Prayer request uh, for uh, a few people here. I uh, want to specifically pray for uh, Mark Holm and his family. Uh, they lost their mother, uh, Dorothy, and so uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, prayers for Chad Gagnon. He's a nephew of Colleen and Jim Kimberly. Uh, last I heard, he was in the Mayo Clinic. Um, hopefully, he's uh, doing better. I have to catch up with, I don't think they're here today, but um, I'll have to touch base with them, see how they're doing. And then also, a uh, prayer for um, Greg and Irma Zwald's son in law, Jason. Um, Greg, any? Yeah, he's back home, had um, viral meningitis. So, you know. <laughs> dragged out a lot from that. Doing better. Doing better, though. Okay, Thanks. good. Well, continue to pray for his recovery. His meningitis is a tough, tough thing. Um, before I invite our friend Gerard up, do we have any other announcements? All right, Gerard. If you all saw in your bulletin, uh, Wayne Venendal is going to be 100 years old on the 17th, June 17th. Downstairs, when you're having coffee, there's a table set up with cards and stickers and all that kind of stuff. So it would be nice if anybody, kids, adults, whoever, <laughs> can make a card 
and then we'll make sure we get them cards for happy birthday greetings to Wayne and all that. We'll make sure we get them cards to Wayne for his 100th birthday. It's not fancy. It's not going to be Deb Walters fancy. It's just <laughs> standard. So thank you. Thank you, Gerard. And um, yeah, I really encourage you guys. Birthday is not this Monday, but the following Monday. So uh, 100 is a big deal. I don't know what they do here. But I know in the United Kingdom, uh, you get a letter from the king or the queen uh, if you turn 100. So I don't, I don't know if Biden will be sending any letters out, but um, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I would encourage you, uh, if you have a family member, what, what does it hurt to ask them, hey, there's a guy turning 100. They don't have to know him. That's a, that's a big achievement. So uh, I encourage you to do that. And uh, we'll have to figure out if we're going to do something uh, heading out there next week. Um, I'm not sure yet. I have to talk with um, his family to see. But uh, I'll coordinate something with Gerard, and we'll go from there. Uh, last last check. Oh, and thank you, of course, to Crossroads. Excited to have you all, all here today. And uh, service uh, order is a little bit different. We're going to be jumping right into the sermon. Is that right? Yep. Uh, so we're not having a song in between, and we're going to have three songs uh, following our call to worship. Um, all right. Well, with that, let's focus our hearts Minds on the Lord as we enter the call to worship. And our call to worship today comes from Psalm 98, verses 1 through 6. Sing a new song to the Lord who has worked wonders, whose right hand and holy arm have brought salvation. The Lord has made known salvation, has shown justice to the nations, has remembered truth and love for the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Sing out your joy. Sing psalms to the Lord with the harp, with the sound of music. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, acclaim the King, the Lord. Amen. With that, let's rise. Let's greet each other with hugs and handshakes, and we'll worship God in song. Good morning, everyone. In honor of Bowen celebrating their history and their anniversary this weekend, we opened our own little time capsule. And this first medley is going to come from about 50 written songs written, written about 50 years ago. And I'm sure a lot of you will remember them. <laughs> so please join us. Worship his majesty unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flow from his throne unto his own his anthem raise so exalt lift up on high the name of jesus magnify come glorify christ jesus the king majesty Worship his majesty, 
Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created, hast all things created. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy. Glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. glorify the king of kings we will glorify the lamb we will glorify the lord of lords who is the great i am lord jehovah reigns in majesty we will bow before his throne we will worship him in righteousness we will worship him alone he is lord of heaven lord of earth he is lord of all who live he is lord above the universe all praise to him we give hallelujah to the king of kings hallelujah to the lamb Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am, who is the great I am. You may be seated. I don't know why, I'm extra thirsty this morning. When we see God's beautiful holiness, we recognize our own lack of holiness. God is light and truth, yet we live among shadows and lies. People of God, let us acknowledge who and whose we are. Let us ask our powerful God to illumine us with grace and truth in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray. God of love and justice, we long for peace within and peace without. We long for harmony in our families, for serenity in the midst of struggle. We long for the day when our homes will be a dwelling place for your love. Yet we confess that we are often anxious, we do not trust each other, and we harbor violence. We are not willing to take the risk and make the sacrifices that love requires. Look upon us with kindness and grace. Rule in our homes and in all the world. Show us 
how to walk in your paths. At this time, I ask we take just a moment of silence as we reflect on our past week, our past lives, and we give and confess our sins to the Lord our God. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are assured that there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive, no hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. God accepts, God forgives, and God sets free. Receive the forgiving love of God. Thanks be. To God. Amen. Today we have the Heidelberg Q&A 19. And the question is, how do you come to know this? Well, out of context, what, what is it asking? It's alluding to the previous question, which asks, how do we know that Jesus Christ is our mediator? And the answer is, the Holy Gospel tells me. This is extra relevant today in the message. God himself began to reveal the gospel already in paradise. Later, he proclaimed it by the holy patriarchs and prophets and portrayed it by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, he fulfilled it through his dear son. Amen. As ever, we thank you for your tithes, your offerings, your, your offerings rather, your donations. Thank you for doing so. And uh, we will also be following our offering prayer, the prayer of the people and for the people, um, especially those mentioned today. So once again, let's pray. Creating God, all good things come from you. Food and drink, memory and hope, forgiveness of sin, adoption as your children. Through your Spirit, nourish us with these gifts that we may be signs of your grace in the world. With grateful hearts, we offer our hearts and lives to you, the giver of every good and perfect gift through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Lord God, we bring to you the pain, the grief, the worry of those mentioned this morning, especially the family of Mark Holm. We pray for their loss, their grief. We pray for Chad Gagnon. May he be sustained in his illness. And we thank you for the recovery, but pray for that recovery of Jason. We thank you for the family that Jason has and the family of all these people that care about their loved ones. We know, Lord, that you put us through trial and tribulation, but we also know that in spite of the pain we experience in our lives, we know that you are always good, you are always righteous, and your love for us remains forever. It's that love that we know best expressed through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I'm not used to switching immediately to the sermon. I've got to get my notes in order. Everything all right? Good? Okay, just making sure. Hear now the word of the Lord from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God of all history, thank you for the Bible. Through your word we learn that you love your people dearly, and we learn that we are your people. Thank you that your word shapes our identity. Thank you that your word gives us hope for the future. As your word is read and preached, send your spirit so that we can know our role in your ongoing work in our world. Amen. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of Pentecost a few weeks ago that the Holy Spirit is somewhat underrepresented in most Protestant churches, with the exception, of course, of the Pentecostals, also called the Charismatics, who perhaps overemphasize the Holy Spirit, but to be sure that this is part of a very human problem, uh, churches often over or underemphasize different aspects of our faith, especially in particular the Trinity. Some churches overemphasize the grace of Christ and underplay his divinity, or they underplay uh, or under, have an underdeveloped view of God's uh, justice, his holiness, uh, God the Father, rather. Uh, other churches overly stress the judgment of the Father, uh, all that, that kind of hell fire preaching where everyone's just doomed and, and kind of underplays the fact that we have Christ as our Redeemer. We keep the Trinity in balance. This is, this is what we're supposed to be striving for. And I, but I think keeping that, that, that view of the Trinity in balance in our Christian walks can be a difficult task, uh, but just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's not important. We pray to the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because as Paul writes in Hebrews 4, Christ is our high priest that allows us to come boldly to the Father that is unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. And again, as Paul writes at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2, that while we were dead in our sins, the Spirit of God came upon us to be made alive in Christ. And that is why we attribute our prayers to the power of the Holy Spirit. So while today's scriptural passage is uh, relatively short, and it kind of cuts off at a weird point, I I really wanted to take some time to discuss the Holy Spirit uh, because it's so underdeveloped, at least as far as my preaching has been concerned. When's the last time I mentioned the Holy Spirit besides Pentecost? Sure, I've, I've mentioned the Holy Spirit. When, when have I actually talked at length about the Holy Spirit? Probably not too much. And that's, that's my fault for doing that. So I want to start with a, a little bit of uh, a word study here as we uh, talk about the context, the implications. And I know these sometimes can be dry, but, but I really do think it can be neat when we see how these words tie into other things. Now, uh, I've already said a few times that the Koine Greek, this is the original ancient Greek language used in the New Testament, that uh, that word for Holy Spirit is pneuma hagias. And if you can recall your world history, does anyone know, if you can shout it out, top of your head, what word has hagia in it? Had anyone ever heard this? Hagia Sophia, anyone ever heard of that? Hagia Sophia? Oh, no, no one? Okay, well, this is a big, giant, classic church. It's a mosque now, but it was a historical church in Istanbul in Turkey. Uh, This is something I I, I think I learned about in early high school, but I definitely remembered it. But that's uh, holy wisdom. Sophia is wisdom. Hagia, Hagias is uh, uh, holy and holy wisdom. That's what that means. In Numa, that should be easy for you all. Again, I've talked about that before. If you've used a pneumatic tool, what is that? It's an air-powered tool. Because that's what pneuma means. It means air. And thus, pneuma hagias is Holy Spirit, Holy Air. That is why the study of the Holy Spirit is called pneumatology. So today, 
You can say you've learned some pneumatology, and if I had started with that, you might have thought, well, that's a big complicated word. I don't know what pneumatology is, and I don't understand, but now I hope you see it. it doesn't have to be that hard. These words tie into things. You go, oh, okay, pneumatic wrench, pneumatic uh, whatever. Yeah, pneuma, tool, pneumatology, I get it. And that leads us into the word that John wrote here because he doesn't use pneuma. He doesn't use hagias in transcribing for Christ. He uses a very unique word, parakletos, or what has become shortened by most pastors and seminarians today is the paraclete. That's the title of today's message. Today's scripture in verse 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Now, depending on which translation you use, this will say one of several things. The ESV, which is uh, normally what I send to Cassie to have on our slides, uh, they translate it as helper, as do many others. Uh, But Bible versions may translate parakletos as counselor, comforter, advocate intercessor, strengthener, or if you like the message translation, friend. Messages. I don't hate the message, but it's kind of goofy. But uh, if you like the message, I'm not going to steal it from you. And while I prefer some of the translations to others, the point here is that parakletos, the Holy Spirit, is all of these things to some degree. Now, I want to take just a second to talk about that word paraclete, parakletos, kletos, directly tied in with another word that I may have talked about before, ecclesia. Anyone know what ecclesia is? You can shout it out if you do. Brian's not allowed to. The church, the ecclesia, it's related to that. All ties in, all comes together. So this is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gives us hope. May God, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope, Romans 15, 13. The Holy Spirit provides us with comfort and joy. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1.6. And the Holy Spirit regenerates us as new believers. This is really important, of prime importance. The Holy Spirit, again, regenerates us as new believers. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5. And friends, that is the miracle of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Paul says we are, what, dead in our sins, Dead in our trespasses. What can a dead man do? Let's pretend you don't know what a zombie is. You've never seen The Walking Dead or Evil Dead or any of these zombie movies. What can a dead person do? Nothing. Not a single thing. It is not until God, the Father, on behalf of Jesus, or Jesus on behalf of the Father, rather, sends his spirit upon us, that we can come to him, that we are enabled to have faith in his son, Jesus Christ, that allows us to approach his throne. And that is the amazing grace that we sing of when we sing, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now with all this said, we have a bit of a background in which to to grasp who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, the third person of the Trinity, not the Father, not the Son, but still co-equal and co-eternal is our one God who regenerates us and comforts us and so much more. But that still leaves a, a, a lived aspect that I haven't touched upon. I think it's also quite relevant, quite important. And this is where I think uh, some of you might appreciate a little bit about that lived experience, uh, because some of you, in, maybe not on my end, but on the other end, may be familiar with some of this. Now, the Holy Spirit seems to have a particular place within the 
lexicon of Christian language, at least here in this country. Uh, What do I mean by that? Well, if you know me and you know some of my story, you might recall that uh, I I didn't grow up as a Christian. Yes, my mother said we were Christians, uh, but saying you're a Christian does not make you you a Christian any more than if I say I'm a chicken. It doesn't make me a chicken. Uh, Words have meaning and, and these conversations become difficult when we're a little too loose with what words mean, and uh, things have to fit a certain criteria to be considered something. Yes, I, I don't, I'm not a chicken because I don't have a beak, I don't lay eggs, it's not that I'm aware of. So going to a uh, Christian college in Southern California and, and, and coming into my faith, to, coming to faith really, um, something I encountered was a lot of Christian language, which I'd never really been exposed to before. And especially after I decided uh, uh, during my time in college that I was going to be going to seminary, a question I got asked a lot of was, did God call you? Or more relevant to this uh, message today, did or how did the Holy Spirit reveal this to you? And I think these questions would have started around uh, 2016. So I can tell you that eight years later, after years of seminary education and a few years of pastoring, I still have no idea what they're talking about. Because I don't think they do either sometimes. Really. I remember it it vividly. I was asking a professor about what seminary was like because he was ordained. It was uh, my New Testament professor. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Old Testament And uh, after a few minutes talking, he asked, uh, by the way, how did the Holy Spirit call you to this? And I just asked him, because I'd been asked that a few times at that point. And I was like, can you tell me what you mean by that? Because I get asked that all the time. And and I I don't know. Do you you mean, did God speak to me? Uh, Did I feel something in my chest? What what does that mean to you? And his response was, "Well, well, what does it mean to you? He turned it around on me. I was like, but you asked me the question. You, when you asked me that question, you meant something. Were you just trying to have like a blank uh, uh, thing going on here? You were just seeing how I'd fill in the spot? And I said, well, are you, are you, again, are you asking me, did God physically audibly speak to, speak to me? Um, and he said, yes, it could be audible, but I don't think it is for most people. But again, how did the Spirit call you? You just kind of repeated the question. And I, I think I was so flustered by his non-answer, I, I just rambled and and uh, said some things about uh, how I had gotten to that point. Um, but, but what's the point of the story? What's the takeaway? The takeaway is, do you think that the Spirit is calling you to something? Or have you, rather? That's probably a better way to ask that. Have you in your life felt like, or even said, well, I did that because I felt like the Holy Spirit called me to it. And did you ever ask yourself really hard, did you think about it, what did, why? Think about it now. If you've thought that, think to yourself, what made you think that? Was it that warm, fuzzy feeling? Was it audibly? I have a good friend of mine who told me that he prayed one day, and he, he's embarrassed to share it because he thinks people think he's nuts when he says it, but God spoke to him. I've heard stories like that. Now, I can tell you, and I think I've said this before, I've never had God speak to me, not, not audibly if that's disappointing to you, I'm sorry. I, I've never had a, a voice appear in my head and say, uh, yes, my, my servant, yes, my son, go preach the gospel. I've never had that happen. So why am I here today? How did I get called here? Well, God uses people in weird circumstances. We've seen that all throughout the Bible. Do, do I need to go over the book of Jonah? Do I need to talk about him being chased despite not wanting to do things? And, and uh, I mean, God did uh, speak to him. But the point is, is that we all come to things through different ways because God uses different means to bring people to him. And for me, it was just one of those experiences where I I didn't have an audible experience, but how I know now, or at least I hope now, that I am called to this is the affirmation of where I am today. So when I wanted to be a chaplain in the army, that was something I kept being asked. How, How do you know that God's calling you to this? First time I really knew was when I went to West Point. That's the United States Military Academy. And I had to minister to cadets for a month. New cadets right out of high school. Most affirming experience I ever had in chaplaincy. Getting to spend time with those, uh, uh, not really soldiers yet, but trainees, those cadets, 
that were coming up to me, asking me questions, looking for help, wanting insight, wanting me to pray with them, trusting in me, and then coming back for more, that felt affirming. Now, does that certify absolutely with all certainty that that's what I was called to do? No, but it was a pretty good indication that that was where I was supposed to be. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, maybe the Holy Spirit isn't calling me to this. And that can be scary too. But it's a question we need to ask. What does the Bible say about this? Does the Bible say the Spirit will some, in some shape or form inform us of life's choices? Uh, the answer is yes, in some ways. And we'll get to this in two chapters, because again, we're in John 14. But John 16, 8 says, When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sign and righteousness. The the Scottish, the Scottish evangelist, Oswald Chambers, once wrote this on this topic. Conviction of sin is one of the rarest things that ever strikes a man. It is the threshold of an understanding of God. Jesus Christ said that when the Holy Spirit came, he would convict of sin, and when the Holy Spirit rouses the conscience and brings him into the presence of God, it is not his relationship with men that bothers him, but his relationship with God. It is wonderful that the conviction of sin is and should be brought to us by the Holy Spirit. But how, again, do we know? More than the affirmation I got when I went to West Point, what's more important than that? What's what's more important than the warm, fuzzy feelings you get that, yes, this, this feels right? Does anyone know? The Word of God. What is our ultimate source sole source of authority, the Bible. At the end of the day, the Bible is going to be your ultimate source of authority. Whatever the Spirit is convicting you of needs to be commensurate with Scripture. If you think the Holy Spirit is telling you something and it's utterly abiblical, you need to rethink it. Really. If you think, however it's coming to you, that God is telling you, whether you think it's the Holy Spirit, whether you think Jesus Christ appeared, whatever the case is, that God is telling you to donate all your money to charity, I can't tell you if God actually said that. I can't tell you if that's the right choice for you. But I can say that sounds great if that's really what you're committed to. If you really think God's calling you to do that, wow, that's powerful. More power to you. It's not going against Scripture, though. That's, that's the thing. It's, it's not abiblical. If you want to give all your money away, that's perfectly fine. However, if you think the Spirit appeared to you or in some way informed you that you need to drown your children, don't do that. Now, some would say, well, what about the story of Abram? God told him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh... Yeah, did he go through with it? I mean, he he did, but he was kind of prevented from completing that, and it happened once for a very specific purpose. It wasn't like this just kept happening, and God calls us to commit infanticide, and then we, eh, well, he didn't intervene this time. For the one story of Abram, by the way, you see dozens of stories speaking to nonviolence, loving children as Jesus does, Caring for your families, loving your neighbor, loving your enemy. So yeah, you do have the Abram story, but when you take the whole breadth of Scripture, the whole context of Scripture, it seems like those are a lot more weighty when you talk about that. So now we've talked about the Holy Spirit's title, the Holy Spirit speaking to us. So how do we make sense of today's scriptural passage? And I know we've Uh, or we're glossing over verse 15 a little bit where Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I want you to just put that on the back burner. I didn't want to just ignore it. Then you go, wait a second, because you always read through scripture. You you don't just skip. Um, So I'm still going to read it, but I'm going to reference it because it all ties together. 
Uh, put that in the back burner. It'll become more relevant. Uh, but once again, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Think of Christ's last words here. Think particularly hard, for he dwells with you and will be in you. If you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you. And I know it becomes complicated because we talk about the Holy Spirit didn't really come upon people until Pentecost. This is a controversial theological take, but um, some would say because we're part of one covenant, the Old Testament saints did have the Holy Spirit upon them. Uh, some would disagree. We're not going to get into all that. But the point is, is that at least today, we know for certainty this is not disagreed upon. The Holy Spirit dwells upon you if you are in Christ. And it's one thing for you to sin and know that in some way God knows and is watching in the same way that we think our parents might have caught us stealing cookies for the cookie jar, breaking curfew, jumping out the window, breaking our arm. It didn't happen to me, it happened to my cousin. But remember these words from Ephesians. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit indwells in us, he can be grieved by our actions. And I really want you to consider the, the momentousness of that. For people who deny the personhood of the Holy Spirit and say it's just the impersonal force of God and there is no Trinity, so on and so forth, how do you grieve an impersonal force? You can't. The Holy Spirit's a person, third person of the Trinity. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we sin in a similar way to, to grieving our parents when we break the rules. In a similar way. It's not a perfect analogy. But consider that word grieves. It, it really does strike me as, um, I'm sure we've heard this before, you break the rules, and what does your dad or your mom say? I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. How many of you have actually said that to your kids? I haven't said it yet to Leaf, but I know it's coming. And that's when I'm going to close my eyes and go, oh, no. <sighs> the older I get, the more I get those moments. And I'm sure for people who are much older than me, you go, oh, shut up. <laughs> but hey, we all go through it, right? We hope to. But I really want you to consider this as you, as you go about your day. I want you to consider... A, who the Holy Spirit is. Two, no, I'm just kidding. B, what the Holy Spirit is doing within you and how you can recognize that if it's biblical or abiblical, remembering that to, to seek out the Scripture, to align, see if it, it aligns with what Scripture is saying to you or what it says. And by the way, we, we are not bodies unto our own. We are a community. Let's not forget that I know in our context in America, I mentioned our country a few times, but it's relevant. Individualism is high. This is a community of faith. This is why church is still very important. I can't stress that enough. And I'm not saying that because of this church. I'm saying it for all churches. If you're listening online, please go to a church. I don't even care if you give money to this church and you watch us online. I would rather you not give money to this church if you watch this online, and actually go physically to a church. That's, I think, much more important. And every pastor right here who says that, I've heard several, I thank them for saying that, because it's very important. It's not, a, it's not an excuse. But thank you all for being here. But the, the, the point is, is that um, amidst those things, I want you to consider them. I want you to consider and remember the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit has not just done for you, not just done for us, what it's doing, or what he's doing in us. And when I mentioned the community, I brought that up because when we are trying to remember uh, to keep Scripture in mind, well, it's not just what I read in Scripture and that conforms with what I want. You go to the community. Go to the pastor, go to uh, your fellow Christians, go to the elders, 
Talk it out. Work it out. What a gift we have that not only we have a helper, a counselor, a supporter that is not just there for you, but is with you. And again, what a gift we have that not only did God the Father give his son for our sakes, and not only did did Christ die for us, but the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is there to indwell with us, to comfort us, to guide us, and to inform us in our Christian walks and our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we thank the Holy Spirit for his being with us, enabling us to have faith in your Son so that we may be right with you, Father. And while we know it is righteous and good to pray to the Father by the name of Christ, Remind us ever of the power of your Spirit that enables us to do so, whether he's named or not. We pray this again to you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the power of your Numa Hagia, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, let's rise to worship God in song. And do we have an extra song after the benediction? All right, so you'll remain singing. After the benediction, we'll sing and then post it. Great. 
Receive now your benediction. May the love of God enfold us. May the grace of God uphold us. And may the power of God set us free to love and serve all God's people. Amen. You're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. I will praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. You're perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. be done glory glory to the lamb glory glory to the lamb you take me into the land you take me into the land we will conquer in your name we will conquer in your name and proclaim that jesus reigns and proclaim that jesus reigns hail hail line of judah hail hail line of judah how powerful you are how powerful you are